The Ouroboros Cycle, Part 1. There are a lot of SCPs on the SCP Wiki, thousands of them in fact, and among the most notable of these entries are the various proposals for the 001 slot. I've already done a video discussing a number of these proposals, but in sheer size and scope, none of the proposals at this time can compete with the Ouroboros Cycle. This is the first topic I've covered on this channel that I've chosen to deliberately break up into a multi-part series, due to its size, and although the cycle comprises four separate parts, there very well could be more than four videos. The four parts of the cycle are connected to one another, sometimes more blatantly than other times, but they do comprise a singular story. A story involving reality benders, death, destruction, ineptitude, power struggles, gods, humans, and multiple different groups of interest and persons of interest. Viewing my previous videos will help you prepare for this mini-series, but as always, I'll attempt to explain to the best of my ability. Let's begin then with the first part, the children. The individual accessing this file is one of the O5 Council, O5-13 and we see that the children are a Thaumiel SCP, meaning they assist the Foundation in some way with containing other anomalies. They are contained underneath a former church in Mexico, which is designated a military waste disposal site, with drones instructed to kill anyone coming within 10 kilometers. A note by O5-2 states that a number of other false 001 items have been added to the database, to protect the secrecy of this one, and the info on this file should be drowned in memetic kill agents. Apparently, the O5 Council really wants to keep whatever the children are a pretty big secret, so let's find out exactly what they are. The children are nine human beings, aged 4 to 11, who gained anomalous properties after some sort of project occurred. They were improperly used which we'll understand in a bit, which resulted in the death of a high-ranking staff member. Termination of the children was ordered, but they still continued to display signs of life, despite them being functionally brain-dead and buried in a tomb beneath the church. Each anomalous child constantly outputs massive amounts of gamma radiation, measured in the hundreds of gigajoules. When separated from another, this radiation is outputted randomly, which is of course horribly dangerous to anyone in the proximity without protection, but otherwise containable. When brought within proximity of each other, however, things get a bit more interesting. The children are collectively capable of somehow transmitting this radiation across vast distances, resulting in the utter termination of objects, individuals, or even entire places. For your information, researchers at the University of Leicester concluded that it would take about 3 gigajoules of energy to vaporize a human body, which would also be capable of melting 5,000 pounds of steel, to put the children's capabilities into a bit of perspective. The next document provided is the proposal for a project named Twins of God, which resulted in the children. The project was first introduced in 1922, so this goes back quite a ways. The goal of the project was pretty clear, essentially to create an anomalous weapon, wieldable only by the Foundation, that is capable of destroying any hostile anomalous threat at long range. The leader on the project was O5-1, assisted by two other O5 members, further indications that this was a super high priority project. They were given a few anomalous objects, a new containment and testing facility, and at least 50 adult D-Class. They learned that, through the interactions between two of the anomalous objects, objects over long distances could be altered to make them functionally non-existent. Using another item, they can transfer this property to a human, allowing for greater control and if successful, the resulting anomalous human will be handed over to the administrator of the Foundation. 
This entire project was put into motion to deal with a single group of interest, known as the Kingdom of Abaddon, which we'll get to in a minute. The Administrator alone will have access to a number of mind-kill agents embedded in the anomaly to prevent others from utilizing it. There are four different levels of these agents, escalating in effect from reduction of motor functions to reduction of mental faculties to fully dissolving their upper nervous system. Notably, the agent designed to reduce anomalous capabilities is still undergoing development. If these kill agents fail to stop the anomaly or prevent it from falling into enemy hands, security teams are to engage and terminate utilizing long-range ballistic weapons and anti-radiation protection gear. If this fails, the Foundation brings in heavier artillery, continually bombarding the anomaly with cannon fire. If this also fails, an on-site explosive is activated, and the Administrator will follow up on this whatever that entails. Two years into the project, it's run into some issues, as the experimentation has resulted in acute radiation sickness and a handful of casualties. Not great, but not terrible. They reinforce the containment facility and move the personnel chambers off-site. The Kingdom of Abaddon continue to trouble the Foundation, resulting in the Administrator putting in more resources into the project in an attempt to expedite the results. Unfortunately, so far, no human has been capable of surviving the process of gaining the anomalous properties. Basically, their minds would be fried, resulting in random outbursts of energy that would destroy nearby objects and people, and the team would have to terminate. Thus, the idea was born to spread out the anomalous properties across a number of different individuals, to lessen the strain on each one. It seems by this point, though, the Foundation's resources were running low in their war against the Kingdom of Abaddon, and so the supply of D-Class to the facility was running dry. A group of armed Foundation agents entered a church in a small Mexican town, and collected a number of children for testing. The rest of the population was given amnestics and moved out, while the town became the new testing site. 23 of the children were chosen for research, and the rest were terminated. We learn in a letter from the administrator that the project team was authorized to go into the town to find subjects, but only adults. He also instructed them to tread lightly, as enough blood has been shed. Well, it seems that 05-1 didn't care much for the administrator's thoughts on the matter, as they got plenty of blood on their hands and with children, no less. While it might seem as if this is a typical example of some monstrous individuals working for a shadowy organization, it could just be that the ends justify the means in this case. Let's find out about this Kingdom of Abaddon that has the Foundation so spooked. They are marked as Priority Level 5, presumably the highest, with a very high threat level. They are a collection of anomalous humanoids located in the Sahara Desert, each one of them a capable reality bender. This means that capture of these entities has proven to be impossible, and generally exceedingly dangerous. First discovery of the Kingdom of Abaddon was in 1912 by a convoy of French military in northern Libya, who were reportedly attacked by six sorcerers capable of flight and resistance to firearms. 80% of the convoy was wiped out, and the survivors were amnesticized and released. The Foundation would soon encounter the group themselves while raiding a warehouse in southern Egypt belonging to the Church of the Broken God. The MTF there were attacked by a group of anomalous individuals, but managed to fight them off and even capture a lower-ranking reality bender. Through interrogation, the Foundation learned that the Kingdom of Abaddon was a group of reality benders originally from Arabia that went into the Sahara to make their own nation. Using their abilities, they converted a section of the desert into a hospitable kingdom, and began growing their civilization. Newborns were brought before their leader, known as God King Abaddon, who converted them into reality benders. 
Inbreeding and genetic malfunctions plague the closed society, however, and the organization will likely fall within 20 years' time. It seems the God King is aware of this fact, and so now the kingdom is branching outwards across the African continent, attacking Foundation facilities and stealing SCPs. Yeah, an army of hostile, inbred reality benders is certainly a pretty big problem, and having access to a weapon capable of obliterating them from long distances would definitely be handy. The project to create this weapon was finally completed in November of 1924, two and a half years after its commencement and twelve years after initial sightings of the Kingdom of Abaddon. The announcement made by O5-1 claims that they have spat in the face of God and took his throne for their own. After killing hundreds or more D-Class, they managed to successfully turn a group of children into brain-dead living weapons. O5-1 calls the administrator short-sighted for expressing regret about what they did to that Mexican town and to the children, but he says that they are gods now. Thus begins the testing of these godlike children, and we learn that what seems to be happening is that the children are drawing energy from a currently unknown extra-dimensional space, and using that energy to unbind atoms at the quantum level. We got a hint of this earlier, as one of the SCPs they used to make the children was called Harkin's Gateway. The only questions then are, what exactly is it a gateway to, and what exactly is this energy doing to people? Apparently the Foundation does not know, and does not especially care, as the children are doing what they were made to do, eliminate threats. All the children require is a description of a person, place, or object, and they immediately get to work. They tested their abilities on a steel rod, five kilometers away, resulting in its vaporization, with no quantifiable remains left. They tested another rod, 800 kilometers away, with the same result. O5-1 leaves a note that truly this is a weapon built for only the boldest of men. They tested a steel sphere 1,000 kilometers away, with the same result, and then amped it up, pointing the children at a Church of the Broken God worship site in Turkey, 11,500 kilometers away. The site itself was vaporized, but not the individuals inside of it. They then told the children to target an individual at the same site, resulting in his vaporization. The administrator sends a letter to O5-1 expressing his gratitude on the success of the project and how happy he is that they'll finally be able to stop the Kingdom of Abaddon. He goes on, however, to admit his concerns about O5-1 himself, worried that the stress of the project has taken its toll on him. He's planning on promoting him to Site Director of the newly constructed Site-19, and they'll discuss the details when he visits the children next month. O5-1 responds with a simple, I am fine, Administrator. The project is finished. We will complete our task when you arrive." That sounds a little ominous, and sure enough, the next note from a month later tells us that the Administrator was murdered. O5-1 is one of the killers, with three other doctors and an agent listed as accomplices. The Kingdom of Abaddon was apparently wiped out as well as all of the MTF teams assigned to investigate them are recalled from active duty. Examination of the Sahara Desert reveals not a single trace of their civilization, as the children utterly obliterated them. Let's get some explanations then, in the form of an audio recording made by O5-13, whom you might remember is the one accessing this whole document. It's been a long time since the night that the Administrator died, and he mentions that he might be the only one left who still remembers what happened. He begins discussing O5-1, 
who he describes as smart, charismatic, passionate, and most notably, detached. O5-1 was the original designer of the Thaumiel designation, as he had no love for the Foundation's commitment to containment, and thought that they could provide better containment of most of the anomalies if they just utilized some of them. This willingness to use anomalies rather than just keep them locked up might tip off some red flags for you if you've been following this whole series, but I'll save that for the end. As a result of this, O5-1 jumped at the chance to lead the project to create an anomalous weapon, and was given the lead due to his charisma. O5-13 admits how hilariously outmatched the Foundation was against the Kingdom of Abaddon, and although you might be thinking that the SCP Foundation doesn't have too much trouble containing reality benders, keep in mind that this was taking place in the 1920s, when the Foundation was far less capable. Additionally, there were reports that God King Abaddon was a Class 5 reality bender, meaning that he could have just wiped the entire Foundation from existence if he wanted to. As it was, however, they were more systematic, wiping out sites and taking a handful of SCPs with them. O5-13 says that O5-1 was fascinated by the project, and was fascinated by the children. He can still hear their screams in his head from when they put them into the machine and pulled out their souls, replacing them with something else. That also sounds pretty ominous, and another clue that the Foundation at the time was messing with forces far beyond their understanding. The Administrator arrived at the site to witness O5-1 telling the children to destroy the Kingdom of Abaddon. There was a flash of light and although they had no way of knowing if it worked, they breathed a sigh of relief. Then suddenly the administrator disappeared, with his clothes falling to the floor, and O5-1 sprinted away towards an emergency exit. He escaped, along with four other members of the team, and a number of junior and senior staff defected with him. Apparently O5-1 had been planning this rebellion all along, and helped create the project just to facilitate it. They proceeded to bury the children beneath the church, who are likely still alive, and still capable of destroying anything in existence. The only one that knows the activation words, however, is O5-1, who is still missing. The eight members of the O5 Council who remained forged ahead, but O513 still occasionally thinks about those buried children, and about O5-1, wondering if he found whatever it was he was looking for. The final note attached to the file is addressed to O5-13, and I'll take the time to read it in its entirety. 13. When we were young, you asked me if I thought that our dreams would ever be realized if we would ever be able to keep the world truly safe, and hang it up for good. You asked me if I thought we had the means to do so, or if the means existed at all. You asked me to what lengths must we go, what prices we must pay, what allegiances we must forge, in order to achieve perfection. I did not know then. I do know now. There will come a day when the secrets that the Foundation has tried to hide away will rise up from the shifting sands in glorious appearance, when the subjugated will break free from the bonds of their captors, and when the march of progress will no longer be impeded by those who would huddle around their fires, swatting at the ever-growing shadows. On that day, the Foundation will be cast aside, and all that will remain is purpose. Do you hear the black moon howling, 13? You will. Soon. Vive l'insurrection. Vive l'insurrection translates to long live the insurrection. And if it's not clear by now, O5-1 and his compatriots formed the Chaos Insurgency. I suggest checking out my video on that group if you're unfamiliar. 
but we know that they are opposed to the Foundation and have no qualms about utilizing anomalies for their own purposes. The only problem is we don't know what those purposes are. O5-1 had the activation words to utilize the children, but whether or not he's dead now or if he passed those words on to anyone else is unknown. The children, as a standalone SCP-001 proposal, likely would not make many big waves, so we'll have to look at it as part of the Ouroboros cycle to get the big picture. It is an interesting story though, of humans messing with forces beyond both their control and understanding in an effort to protect humanity, which is true for the SCP Foundation as a whole as well. Not all of the questions brought up in this part will get answered throughout the Ouroboros cycle, and that's okay, but it does show us that for many groups in the SCP universe, the ends always justify the means.